So, welcome to EOS HD on YouTube. And uh, today, I'm just going to do a roundup of all the current topics that I've been covering on the site. And um, talk about, you know, my opinion, which I am entitled to, so may as well make use of it. Um, I was plunging the toilet today of the other camera websites. And I came across this article on Petapixel by Jaron, Jaron, and he described my rumour about the uh, EOS R3 sensor as salacious. And uh, so I looked up the meaning of the word, uh, because Americans don't know the meaning of very many. And I looked it up and it said it was pornographic. So my article was actually a piece of pornography about Canon and the R3 sensor being a Sony, maybe, who knows. But the data sheet from Sony does exactly match the specs, the frames per second and everything else, so who knows. And then there was that strange moment where Canon themselves edited out the um, text designed and manufactured by Canon and replaced it with developed, which can mean anything. So, what's going on, I ask, I wonder. So yeah, the, the Petapixel article basically was an attempt, in my opinion, to get me into trouble with uh, Canon's legal department. So it turns out that it's not the first time actually I've been sued by Canon. Uh, because back in uh, 2011, I think it was, same year, I think Jim Janard sued me. Uh, for an article, a satire article. The, uh, the, the nice people at Canon USA reached out and said, hey, got this website, EOS HD. Um, we're going to let Canon rumours continue. But your site, no, we're not going to let it. And uh, basically they were quibbling over the trademark. Uh, even though, and the logo design as well. Even though the... Um, the EOS sort of acronym can mean anything, and it's a Volkswagen car. They still had an issue with my little poxy website back in 2011. And I've never quite been able to recover my goodwill towards the company since then. And it turns out I didn't need to recover the goodwill because they deserved every line of criticism on EOS HD for what they've done with the EOS line and video over the decade. The amount of lies told and the rip-offs and the crippled features, it's been disgusting ethically. And it's so painful to see how big time rewarded they've been in terms of the sales, the popularity, the reputation, everything. People just go crazy for Canon. And I've never been able to get my head around it. But anyway, uh, moving on, I'd like to talk about the GFX100, the Hasselblad um, H3D from prehistoric digital camera ages, and the Panasonic S1H. Because I believe, in terms of video, these are the closest in the look to the massive sensor in the, in the Hasselblad, and the beautiful colour science, whether it's uh, the CCD in there or Hasselblad's own colour science. It's spectacular. So in part one of this video we're going to talk about that look and why it's so special and why these two cameras, in my opinion, uh, come the closest uh, to it. And then we'll touch on this, the EOS R6, um, which I absolutely hate. So um, stay tuned for part one coming up after a message from our sponsor. Yes! So I've got some uh, site news as well before we start talking about cameras again. And uh, that is that EOS HD is going back to Berlin after a break a much needed break from the chaos of Berlin's creative scene. Uh, I'm going to go back and shoot some things, which will be uh, 
uh, a change uh, from shooting sheep and fields. So I'm very much looking forward to getting a um, place set up there, getting all my cameras set up there, a studio for YouTube, and um, I look forward to being in Berlin again, I think. So it's going to be interesting. I think uh, you'll be hearing more from me in the coming uh, months uh, or maybe the coming um, year once I've settled in, got some nice pancakes um, on the table, that kind of thing. So anyway, I think uh, it'd be interesting to talk about the um, Hasselblad first. So the thing is, there is no modern digital equivalent to this, um, apart from the Hasselblad uh, H6D uh, 100C, which costs £20,000 uh, new. No, used, used now. Um, that camera shoots 16-bit RAW 4K from a sensor the same size as this. That makes that sensor larger than the GFX100. Now I'm curious as to why um, that product even exists. Because for a start it really is aimed at stills professionals at the very highest level in, in the advertising world, commercial photography world. So it's not really a video, it's not really a YouTuber's camera is it? Or a run and gun kind of thing. So I'm just wondering why it has such good video specs, quite impressive. And it would be nice if you're listening, Fuji, to have any kind of internal RAW recording on your £10,000 camera. That would be a great bonus. Just pay the licensing. I know that Red uh, has all the patents, that kind of thing. But can we please stop messing around with HDMI cables? Everything goes out to this or that. And it's like, I don't want to be bothered. The whole point of having a camera that is this tiny is for you to be inconspicuously grabbing shots in a documentary sense, which is what I love to do. It, it, on the street, to be a street photographer is to blend in and not be noticed and to get that natural look. And it's the same thing with documentary and for video and for films. I like to capture that uh, moment like Henry Cartier-Bresson did uh, in video is very special. And you can't do it if you've got Atomus Ninja there massive big mic there and a cable and then like spider cage from the future that kind of shit i just don't like it so where was i yeah hasselblad uh this does not exist um and it shoots does not shoot video but the look in the stills mode is just mind-blowing and i'm thinking what can match the instant gratification you get from the raw file when you dial in your grade and it just responds beautifully and there's not that plastic modern clean sheen over it like you get with every CMOS sensor and I know people have disproven that CCD is any different and they keep saying that yes CMOS is the future and I completely agree it's a lot faster the technology a lot cleaner in low light but we've lost something and I can't quite put my finger on it uh, what exactly it is but every time I open the raw files from this uh, my eyes pop out in delight at the colours and it cost me two grand as well so a bigger sensor than the GFX 100 for two thousand pounds amazing the viewfinder is enormous so what equal is there in the video world? I guess the obvious comparison would be high resolution, 4K, massive sensor, high dynamic range, brilliant colour science, and that is not the Canon R6, it's the Fuji GFX100. So from Panasonic we have the S1H, and I think in terms of the look between this and the Sony A7S Mark III, I really do prefer the Panasonic's codec, the colour signs, the V-Log profile. It's a lot nicer, much more cinematic. And um, the major problem, I think, in S-Log3 is the 
native, the dual native ISO on the A7S Mark III. Now, the base ISO is 640, which is pretty good, because I remember having to shoot 3200 on the original model in S-Log in broad daylight, which was a complete nonsense. So, that's good. What's not so good is that it performs so noisily in S-Log uh, the high ISOs that you most normally use indoors. So that would be anything from 3200 up to 6400, 8000, 10,000. 10,000 is horrific. So uh, if you've underexposed accidentally an S log at 10,000, kiss goodbye to that file forever. So the trick is to simply try to stick it at 12800 all the time when you're in low light. It doesn't really work because no DP exposes for a native ISO of 12800. Um, 1600 at a push maybe. But what lighting setup and exposure um, indoors needs 12800? It's just too high. So, hmm, food for thought, I'd say there, with S-Log 3. And meanwhile, with V-Log on the S1H, clean as a whistle at all the regular ISOs up to like 12800, and 12800 is fine as well. And then, no, it doesn't extend quite as high at the really top end as the A7S 2, which cleans up suddenly when the dual native ISO kicks in at 12800. But it's a much more practical uh, camera, all the normal ISOs. So, something for Sony to address there, I think. And um, well done for Panasonic for making um, the more practical camera in that sense, in low light. Even though the A7S III is sold and marketed as a low light tool, I do prefer the S1H in low light. It's just inky, creamy, black shadows, details, just perfect. This is a really nice image, which makes it all the more frustrating to be once again insulted. Uh, by the lack of aperture, priority mode and other things. So uh, the files are uneditable in Premiere at 10-bit 422. So you will have to learn a completely new editing piece of software if you are a Premiere user. Uh, it remains to be seen whether Apple M1 hardware accelerates 10-bit 422 from the Canon cameras. Um, but it's, you know, Fuji, uh, they shoot 10-bit 420 for that reason. It plays well in Premiere. It has better compatibility and playback performance. Hardware accelerated on NVIDIA cards and so on. So, yeah, the A7S Mark III, that also has um, the same, you know, 10-bit 420 option, and, uh, but not Canon. So you basically got one codec if you want to shoot Canon RAW, Canon Log, sorry. There's no Canon RAW on this baby. And uh, you basically got uh, the choice of 10-bit if you don't want to shoot Log. So no standard colour profiles in 10-bit, which is another slightly frustrating thing. Now, <clears throat> yeah, it is sort of halfway there. It's like it's by no means a bad camera. But I'm just baffled at the need to keep chopping away at features. Because compared to the EOS R, that had all your exposure modes in video mode. And it had uh, basically more features. Uh, dual pixel RAW, uh, various other features. Um, on this, uh, the Zebra, sorry, uh, the histogram, disappears when you're recording. What is the use of a histogram? Uh, you can't use during a shot to expose from. And uh, the other issue, uh, there are so many, it's just hard to reel them off the top of my head. 
There has never been a more despised camera that has been released in, in the last 10 years. There's this little Hasselblad Sony and uh, it was a blatant attempt by the coked up marketing executives, allegedly my opinion, uh, that thought, wouldn't it be great if we could get a Sony A99 and put a nice top plate on it? Silver. It's silver and it's got different knobs on the top. 10,000 euros. And they thought, yep, that'll, that'll, that sounds easy enough, we'll do that. And uh, they did. But I think it's a funny thing that sometimes the craziest, most ironic situation turns out to, to tell you something important, to reveal an insight into what could be done about the blandness of these identical cameras that are churned out like Toyota vehicles. They're so boring and everything is the same. And I really wish they would int introduce some personality and some artistic design into the manufacturing and the design of the body. Because it would be wonderful. I mean, the Panasonic S1H with its massive viewfinder, big sensor, beautiful image, cutting edge specs, is such a beautiful creative tool. But look at it, it's just, it needs something like some charm, something that makes me want to go, yay, I want to pick that up, shoot with it, and it's unique. And uh, that's what I feel Hasselblad, in all their craziness, and their despicable marketing ploy, got correct with this little beauty. And I think only a hundred were made. Uh, they probably stopped after a hundred, having read the internet. So that was the end of that little design thing. And who can forget the Luna as well, which was a NEX7 <laughs> with a wooden grip. Beautiful stuff. Well done, Hasselblad. Did not damage the brand. And I very much love owning one now. I found it used for two grand, which is about the same price as a Sony A99, which it basically is. So, so yeah, if you enjoyed uh, this, this video, like and subscribe. If you did not enjoy the video, go away. And tune in next time for more EOS HD on YouTube, reluctantly, very reluctantly.